heaven is win someone's soul. And because the Bible says that the dead which die in the Lord rest from their works, and their works do follow them. And therefore, the time that we have on this earth is very short. This I say, brethren, says the Bible, the time is short. And the Bible describes in many places the brevity of time that we have. He says that uh, our days are as a weaver's shuttle. They're like a tale that is told, says Moses. Our days are like a, a vapor. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a time and then vanisheth away. Just a little time, a season, Peter calls it. And therefore, it's just a brief moment, and uh, the sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I've sighed for, the fair sweet morn awakes. And only one life and will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Third, soul winning is the one thing that keeps people out of hell. The only way that someone can be prevented from going into hell is if another person shows them the gospel and saves them from eternal loss, eternal damnation. And I have to ask you a question. How much do you have to hate someone to let them go to hell? You see, if you killed another person, if you took the life, physical life of another individual, you would be a very vile, wicked person. But when you allow someone else to go to hell, you're even worse of a person. Having eternal life, having the ability to, to pull them out of the fire, Having the ability to save someone from hell, and you refuse to use it. You refuse to, having eternal life, lay hold on eternal life, and utilize that gift of eternal life to be able to bring that gospel to other people. Having the message of salvation and keeping it to yourself, you are the most selfish, wicked person. You are a wicked and slothful servant who refuses to show anyone else how to go to heaven. Because hell is a place of everlasting fire. It's a place of everlasting punishment, everlasting decay. Everlasting darkness, darkness that could be felt, outer darkness that Jesus calls it. It is everlasting restlessness where they have no rest day or night. Everlasting thirst, everlasting shame, and everlasting chains. It's something that never ends. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here, reads the gates of hell, as it were. Because when you go into hell, it's a place of everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And therefore, when you do not preach the gospel, you don't recognize that soul winning is the one thing that's able to keep people out of hell. The one thing that's able to keep people from going to this terrible place. Luke chapter 10, fourth. Soul winning is the one thing that Jesus told us to pray for. Now, in Jesus' entire earthly ministry, up until the uh, Passion Week of the Lord Jesus, I can find no place where Jesus tells his disciples to pray for something, except one time. Now, when Jesus is with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, he tells them to watch and pray the internal temptation. But I only find one place in the Bible where Jesus makes a prayer request of his disciples. Luke chapter 10, verse number 2. It says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Amen. Jesus is not saying that we should pray for the person who's getting a political office. Jesus is not telling us that we should pray uh, that we can make more. Jesus is not telling us that we should pray that we can have a nicer life, a more comfortable life. He tells the disciples, here's what I want you to pray for. The only time in his public earthly ministry before the Passion Week that Jesus is giving a prayer request to his disciples, what is he telling them to pray for? Laborers to go into the harvest, right as he's sending out these 70 other apostles to go out preaching in these cities the gospel. And therefore he tells them, I want you to pray for this. It is the one thing that Jesus, in some sense, told us to pray for. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 5th. Soul winning is the one thing that Jesus needs us in order to do. Jesus can do a lot of things. Jesus created all things. By him were all things created, and by him all things subsist, consist. And Jesus Christ is the great creator. The Bible describes to us then that Jesus as God is the one who made all things. By him were all things made, and without him was there anything made that was made. However, there is just one thing that Jesus needs us in order to do. Just one thing that Jesus Christ requires our service in. First Corinthians chapter 12, it says in verse number 21, speaking about the church as a body, he says, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Now, the church is a body. Now you are the body of Christ, he says, and members in particular. Now, what does the Bible describe? the head as being, or who occupies this position. Because elsewhere in Paul's writings, that is in Ephesians 5, and Colossians still say that Jesus is the head of the church. Now notice what it says in verse 21. He says, The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. Elsewhere, when Paul speaks about the feet, as in Ephesians chapter 6, and in Romans chapter 10, he says, How beautiful are the feet of the priest of gospel of peace. In Ephesians chapter 6, Your feet shall with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is he referring to? The preacher of the gospel. So in some proverbial sense, the head, Christ,
cannot say to the feet, the preacher of the gospel, the soul winner, I don't need you. Jesus needs us in order to save other people from hell. The Lord Jesus, our great head, needs us, the lowly feet, in order to bring the message of the gospel. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Now then it says we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God. So then Jesus Christ is begging and pleading people to be saved through us, by means of us, and so it's necessary for us to go preach in the gospel. It's the one thing Jesus needs us to do. Jesus said that without me you can do nothing. But I would also say that without us, Jesus is determined to do nothing in line of pre-saving people's souls from hell. He says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And as true as this verily, verily statement of Jesus is, it is also to be understood that even though no one comes to the Father but by Jesus, no one goes to Jesus but by you. How shall they hear without a preacher? And therefore he says in Romans chapter 10, giving the reverse order in which someone is saved, verse number 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And so he continues. Now, notice how we have these five phases, as it were, in what usually takes place as someone getting saved. First, someone is sent. Then they preach. Then the person who they're preaching hears, and then they believe, and then they call upon him. So, sending, preaching, hearing, believing, calling. And he describes how the necessary link inside of this chain reaction, which causes someone to get eternal life, is the preacher. How shall they preach? And so the Bible says that, uh, how shall they hear without a preacher? Now that means, he didn't say preachers. God's just looking for one person, a preacher. He's just looking for one individual. I saw a man that should stand in the gap. God's just looking for one minister by whom they can believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. He's just looking for one individual who he can use as a preacher of the gospel. Amen. And therefore what the Bible describes is that soul winning is the one thing that Jesus needs us in order to do. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. Six, soul winning is the one thing that only humans are allowed to do. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which try their hearts. God has a multitude of angels, as well as creatures, and a uh, very subservient and useful nature that he could employ in the service of evangelization, but he does not. God has many angels, but the most anointed cherubim is not able to preach the most blessed gospel, and they would. The Bible describes in the book of Psalms, chapter 103, of his angels that they do his commandments hearkening unto his word. Every time God dispatches Gabriel or Michael or any other angel that he has in his army, his, the, being the Lord of hosts, they do it. They obey him. And the Bible says that the angels particularly love the gospel. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1 of the gospel, which things the angels desire to look into. And if you look in the book of Acts, you'll oftentimes find the angels, although they're not given license to go preaching the gospel, the Bible describes that the angels are, in every sense, assisting the preachers of the gospel. Jailbreaking Peter, for example, and doing all kinds of other things like that. Now, angels kill lots of people, but they never save anyone's soul from hell. And so the Bible describes then that this is the one thing that a human could do, because an angel wouldn't do it. Acts chapter 11. This is recounting the story of Cornelius. How Cornelius, this Gentile, is going to be saved by the message that Peter preaches to him. Partway through verse 13 it says, He had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said to him, Send men to Joppa, this is the angel talking to the unconverted Gentile, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Now just think for a moment about this. We have an angel of the Lord here. Now don't you think an angel knows how to preach the gospel? Don't you think an angel is much more qualified and certainly has probably memorized the entire Bible to be able to be able to evangelize this person, save this person's soul from hell? But yet, what does he do when he appears to Cornelius? He says, go to Joppa and you'll find a man called Peter. He will tell thee words whereby thou and all the house shall be saved. Because it is not the job of the angels to preach the gospel. That's why the Bible describes that when the angel breaks Peter out in Acts chapter 5, he said, go and speak all the words of this life. Go and proclaim the gospel unto all other persons around. Let's go back to chapter 9 of Luke. Luke chapter number 9. Angels don't preach the gospel. Nature doesn't preach the gospel. The Bible says in Psalm 148 verse 8, fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy wind fulfilling his word. And God, it says the Bible, hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. God could use nature to preach the gospel in every which way he desires. Just like it says in, of Jesus' coming, he cometh with clouds. He could also write with the clouds in the sky the message of salvation. Amen. 
The Bible describes that God is someone who is able to use nature for all of his ends and all of his purposes. Jesus says that the wind bloweth where it listeth, but it could blow where God wants it to blow. And he could gather together leaves and dust and dirt and make the message of the gospel out as well. It, but Elijah, as we understand now, found that the Lord is not in the fire, not in the earthquake, He's not in the great wind and so on, but it's a still small voice that God uses. So God doesn't use nature. He doesn't use other creatures. God has many, many other things that he has created on this earth, which could be used for preaching the gospel. Remember Balaam's donkey? The Bible says that the uh, dumbass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And so a donkey begins to open its mouth and speak to Balaam. And not I thine ass on whom thou usest to ride, was I ever want to do so unto thee. So the donkey is communicating information with its mouth, with a man's voice, as the Bible, unto Balaam. God, of course, has lots of animals in his service. And the, the Bible describes that the ravens are bringing food to Elijah. You've got these milch kind traveling the new cart all the way to the coast of Israel. And therefore, animals are obedient to God, and he could use them all. Like, for example, the um, uh, frogs, instead of saying, crick, get, crick, oh, excuse me, the frogs, instead of saying, ribbit, ribbit, right, that's the noise they make, you know what they could say? They could say, believe, 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 <laughs> or the crickets, it's eternal, it's eternal, <laughs> you know, receive Christ as Savior. Goats, they like to make a lot of human noises, no. And if you say, do you have to obey the commandments to go to heaven? No! <laughs> no! They could do that. And the cows could load the gospel. And the dogs could bathe the gospel. And the birds could go tweeting the gospel. But they don't. Creatures don't preach the gospel. Uh, angels don't preach the gospel. Nature doesn't preach the gospel. Who, who gets to preach the gospel, God? Who gets to be the person who goes out evangelizing the world? Oh, just the one who doesn't want to do it. Just the man who refuses, who hardens his neck, hardens his heart, and says, I will not go, sir, and says, I don't want to go. So just human beings are the only ones then that could preach the gospel. It's the one thing that only a human could do. Seventh, preaching the gospel or soul winning is the one thing that will make a Christian precious. How many people on this earth right now? Well, statisticians tell us there's about 8 billion souls on this earth. Now, 8 billion, this is a very large number. I want to ask you a question, how many of those people do you think are saved? How many of them have eternal life? Now, my statistics at this point, being in Africa for three years and preaching the gospel full time, can really give a good understanding of this. Plus, if we look into world religions and understand that all those that preach a false gospel are going to hell, you can really narrow this down to say, well, eight billion, I would imagine that I'd be surprised if one percent of them are even saved. But I would say at best, being conservative, 1% of 8 billion, what is that? 80 million, maybe. But let's just putting it down to 70 million, being conservative. Now, of those people who are saved, the sum to some 70 million, how many of them do you think knows how to preach the gospel? How many of them is able to save another person from hell? I would say about 1%. And now, my statistics can very well bear upon this reality, showing you that of all the persons that we've won to Christ, 1% is a very generous number. Over in Africa, where we're doing our ministry, where you have full-time evangelists to be able to preach people how to go preach the gospel and train people in the work of soul winning, 0.5 is the real number. But 1% will say, for 1% from 70 million is 700,000 people who are saved who can preach the gospel. Now, of those people who are saved who can preach the gospel, how many of them do you think goes out soul winning at least once or so a week and does that for the rest of their life until they die. I would now say 1% again. Some 7,000. In, 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 in the words of the scripture, there are 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee. Now, that makes a Christian who goes out preaching the gospel exceedingly precious. That means that in order for you to shine in heaven, in order to be great in the kingdom of God, all you have to do is learn how to save someone's soul from hell and do that consistently until the day you die. And you're going to be great in heaven. I'm not telling, talking about going with us over to Africa and preaching for you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a week soul winning. I'm not, I'm not telling you to do that. Okay, but can you go soul winning for one hour a week? Can, if, you, if you could do one hour, hey, what about two hours every two weeks? If you could do that, I promise you, when you get to heaven, you're going to be right up there at the table with Paul, Jesus, Peter. You're going to be great. You're not going to be at the table with all the losers who didn't do anything for God. You're going to be at the table with all the people who serve the Lord and therefore won many, and so Christ blesses in a great way. Luke chapter 9. Finally, soul winning is the one thing that only a saved person can do. 
Luke chapter 9, verse 59, and he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now this seems like a reasonable excuse, don't you think? His father's dead. He needs to go bury his dad. Does Jesus have compassion on him? He has compassion on many? Well, no, because of the word here. First. Nothing wrong with burying your father. There's something wrong with burying your father first. And then you put something else before Christ. Something else before the work of God. Something else before the things of the Lord. Suffer me first to go and bury my father. Suffer me first to go do this and that. And what does Jesus say? Verse 60. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now the Lord Jesus is telling them, him, you can do whatever you want, but here's the thing you have to do first. You need to go first preaching the kingdom of God. And notice how he says, let the dead bury their dead. In other words, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. Or we can put it this way. Let the people who are not saved do what they can do. You, being a believer, do what only you can do. Because soul winning is the one thing that only a saved person can do. You see, an unsaved person can come to church today, and they can listen to the preaching of God's Word. An unsaved person can open their Bible and read it. An unsaved person can memorize scriptures, and maybe more than you. An unsaved person can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. An unsaved person can even pray. Cornelius was praying. Lydia was a worshiper of God. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading the scriptures, but not saved in that condition. An unsaved person can do almost everything you do. But what's the one thing that an unsaved person can't do that you can do? Save someone else's soul from hell. Save someone else from eternal perdition. Save someone else from eternal loss. Therefore, soul winning is the one thing that you are saved and left on earth to do. It is the one thing that you can't do in heaven. It is the one thing that keeps people out of hell. It is the one thing Jesus told us to pray for. It is the one thing Jesus needs us in order to do. It is the one thing that only humans are allowed to do. It is the one thing that will make a Christian precious. And it is the one thing that only a saved person can do. You are the greatest fool then. Recognizing that soul winning is the one thing who does not have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And who cannot say with Paul the Apostle, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth. To Jew first and also the Greek. That you should be ready then to preach this gospel and have the preparation of being able to win people's souls. So now, I've been tasked with explaining to you in brief how you can preach the gospel, what you can do to preach the gospel. So let me explain to you how I preach the gospel. As Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. Let me explain to you how we, as we go over in Uganda, believe that soul winning is how we believe that we should do it. Now, of course, there are a multitude of different variations, modifications, and additions, and of course, different personalities, and people will preach in different ways, and it's great. God will use everyone in their own way. But let me just uh, attempt to edify you by explaining to you the way that we preach the gospel in order that you might, in a brief, be able to have an understanding about what you should do, because you say, what should I do? Now understanding all these things, you know, how can I go out and preach the gospel? What can I do? Let me very briefly explain to you what we do. Well, here I have a handout. There's a couple of paper, there's, there's a couple of things I want you to have here. One of them is a paper, double-sided, that talks about how to preach the gospel. Another one is a short strip of paper that has all these verses inside of it that explains, shows, shows you all the verses that I have used preaching the gospel, Jesse has used preaching the gospel, that we have heard someone use preaching the gospel as we've gone soul with hundreds of people, or that we have thought you could use when preaching the gospel. Or it'd be good to know when preaching to someone about how to go to heaven. And so these two things will be very helpful. Let me briefly sketch out for you this. First, the beginning of the gospel, how to preach the gospel, how to start. First of all, you should greet them. And not your brethren only says Jesus, but everyone. Salute them. And of course, introduce yourself to the person. Not being vague, but being clear. I am John. I'm from, if we're over in Uganda, Bible Baptist Church. I'm such and such a person. I'm from Law of Liberty Baptist Church. Greet, introduce yourself, and then question the person. And now, here we have something very important. That when we begin talking to an individual, we want to figure out whether this person is a believer, whether this person is actually saved. So, we will begin to question about what their beliefs about salvation are. Whether they're going to, for example, do you go to church anywhere? And uh, are you a Christian? Or, more specifically, beyond those, what do you believe you have to do to go to heaven? Or, are you sure that when you die, you will go to heaven? Or are you 100% sure that you will go to heaven when you die? 
And so now figuring out what the person believes about salvation. From my understanding, Pastor Fannin labeled this the tie down, where you're trying to figure out what their belief is. And so this is what we need to get, a tie down. We need to figure out what their uh, belief is and what they're trusting in to save them. This is important to get for several reasons, because it determines if they actually need the gospel first. Second, it's something that will allow us to preach in the context of their unbelief. Instead of just simply showing them a nice few verses, we rather are preaching to them saying, well, the Bible says something different from what you believe. Well, the Bible teaches that it's much easier to go to heaven. Well, can I just show you a few verses from the Bible that going to heaven is actually much more simple, or however you might describe it. And so getting this tied down then allows them to be tied down to their beliefs, and so you can preach them in the context of their unbelief. And then you can use this at the end of the gospel to, if necessary, uh, allow them to uh, help them to understand that they were not understanding what you showed them at the beginning, or they did not believe the gospel of Christ when you arrived. Now, we have a systematic way of checking someone's salvation. Of course, this is not what I follow all the time, but it's just an idea. First of all, we like to ask them a gospel question, meaning, are you sure you'll go to heaven when you die, or when you die, will you go to heaven? They can answer in one of three ways. Yes, I'm sure or no, I'm not sure, that's the beginning. And then we always try to get what they're trusting in. And so we say, if they say yes, we say, what do you have to do to go to heaven? They say, I'm sure I'll go to heaven, but I have to obey the commandments, <coughs> repent of my sins, be good, serve God. A response that indicates the person does not believe in Christ. They're trusting in their works. At which time, a bad response, we would call it, we invite them to listen to the gospel. Or they could give a good response, just believe in Jesus. It's a free gift, it's eternal. It's by faith, whatever. And then at that point, we would now ask another question. And if it was unclear, saying, accept Jesus as your personal Savior, or phrases that are not found in the Bible, uh, receive Jesus into your heart, and so on, we would ask them another question like this, an assumptive question, saying, oh, you believe in Jesus. Okay, yes, we believe the same, but do you think it's enough to believe in Jesus, or do you have to obey the commandments? Or do you have to be a good person to go to heaven? Do you have to serve God to go to heaven? And whatever. And of course, if they're getting it wrong at this point, yes, you have to obey the commandments or you're going to hell, this tells us the person's not saved. At which point we will invite them to listen to the gospel. However, if they're still continuing to get the right answers in the sense that they believe the gospel, we will then move on to an eternal security question. What if you believe in Jesus, but you go on committing sin? What if you believe in Jesus and you do such and such a sin? Would you go to heaven or to hell? Oh, I'd go to hell, this person's not saved because they don't believe that God's given to us eternal life. They don't believe that uh, what Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes in me has everlasting life. Yeah. And so then we offer them to preach the gospel. If they do get it right, you may ask another question or so, but we may be dealing with a believer here, and then it's just time to exhort them, and, and thankful for the fellowship that we have, the camaraderie we have, of finding a fellow believer. Now, uh, informing them, and then offering to preach the gospel. And it's very important to use persuasion when preaching the gospel to people. Because uh, the Bible says that uh, whom we preach warning every man. And it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that uh, we should be persuading people, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Amen. And so we have to be persuading people to be a Christian, as Paul was told that he was doing with Agrippa. Almost that persuades me to be a Christian. Now, <clears throat> let me explain that there's something that I use while in America, which we call this uh, gospel seed. And I found it to be somewhat effective when uh, showing people, tr trying to get people to listen to the gospel. As many people will recoil from listening to the gospel, even though they don't believe it, what we often will do is just simply say, oh, okay, no problem, can I just leave you with a, a verse before I go? And we'll show them John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, or whatever. And then they may get interested in the gospel by hearing that verse, at which time we can offer the gospel again. And so we sow the seed, and then hopefully we can begin preaching the gospel there. This um, liars in wait, we're kind of drawing them out and trying to preach to them, so to speak. And so that, that's kind of a method that we use when preaching here, and I've seen it be able to win many people to Christ. Now, beyond that, we come to the actual substance of the gospel, all right? And uh, when preaching the gospel, there are three things, or three elements to it. First of all, there is a doctrinal element, meaning that there are five doctrines or teachings that we want the person to understand in order so that they can be saved. The first doctrine is the doctrine of sin, that we are sinners, and that as sinners, uh, none of us is righteous, and so on. The second doctrine is the doctrine of hell, or the doctrine of eternal judgment, that as sinners we deserve to go to hell, that none of us is deserving of going to heaven. The third doctrine is the doctrine of Christ, who Jesus is, what he did, that he's God, 
that he's sinless. He did no sin. That uh, he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again from the dead. The fourth doctrine is the doctrine of salvation by faith, or the word believe. Now, we teach them, and this is where we spend lots of time, because these are the two doctrines that most people do not believe. And this is the hang-up, and this is the thing that will cause their soul to be damned forever, trusting in their works or thinking that they could lose their salvation, in large part with most people as here, so in Africa. So we teach them that salvation is by faith, that through his name whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins, and that whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. And finally, the doctrine of eternal security, or uh, eternal life here. Now, all of these are things you must believe in order to be saved. That we are sinners, that we deserve to go to hell. Jesus is God, he's the Savior, he's the only way to heaven, and uh, that um, he died on the cross and so on, and he rose from the dead. That salvation is by faith, and that once you're saved, you're always saved. You must believe these to be saved. And so this is the uh, gospel doctrine. That's the first element of the gospel. The doctrinal element. There are three do five doctrines. Second, there is a scriptural element. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And he says in verse 25 that uh, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So we preach the gospel by the word of God. We use the scripture in order to show people how to go to heaven. So there are some recommended Bible verses here. Then there's a third element, which we can call the interrogative element, where we are asking questions of the person to cause them to understand, to interact with them, to engage them, and uh, a lot of those questions are, are written here. Let me say a couple things about these interrogative element. First of all, about hypothetical questions. When if asking someone questions, it's best, for example, eternal security questions, or you're asking whether the person believes you can lose your salvation or not, it's best, I think, to ask in the second person. In other words, what if you believe in Jesus and you sin? What if you believe in Jesus and X, Y, Z? There is another way that's good to ask in the third person. What if this such and such a person believes, but they do thus and so? But asking in the first person, in my opinion, seems to be something that will elicit a response that is emotional as opposed to uh, using their mind or their heart. Where you say, what if I believe and I sin? I've heard many people do this, where you say, what if I believe and I go commit adultery against my wife today? Where am I going to go? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what is this guy planning or whatever? It's uh, really strange, but it, it makes people not want to tell you that you're going to hell. They don't want to offend you and so on. I think it's best to use the second person. What if you believe? That way they think about themselves. But uh, if, of course, you want to use a third person, as I do also, that's also useful. I think the first person should be something you should stay away from in these kind of questions. Now, when asking eternal security questions or questions regarding the doctrine that you can't lose your salvation, I think there are several things that you should know. First of all, that there's generic questions. What if someone believes and someone sins? Or what if someone believes and they disobey, as it were? And then there are specific questions. Such as, what if you believe in Jesus and you steal? What if you believe in Jesus and you kill? What if you believe in Jesus and you do such and such a sin? And uh, both questions are good to ask. Both, I, I do both when I preach the gospel. Another thing is that uh, you don't want your eternal security examples to be extreme. Where you say, what if you believe in Jesus and go burn down an entire school of children? <laughs> or what if you believe in Jesus and take an automatic <laughs> gun and go and mow down a big crowd of people? This is extreme. Another thing is that when preaching the gospel, the doctrine of eternal security, we include the idea of chastisement, that God punishes us as children, and the idea of rewards in heaven, that God rewards us for our works, so that they can have a temperate understanding that we're not telling them to sin. We're not teaching them to do wrong. But even if we do sin, we still go to heaven, and that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But shall we continue in sin? God forbid. And so on. Now, uh, these are some things to keep in mind. And also, when people ask you questions when preaching the gospel, it's a good idea to categorize into one of two things. If it's gospel relevant, meaning, do I have to be baptized to be saved? Or, do I have to go to church in order to go to heaven? You should answer the question immediately that no. All you have to do is to believe. There are people like the thief on the cross who was not baptized, and yet he went to heaven. So on. Uh, then, of course, there's not gospel relevant questions. Like, uh, did Adam have a belly button? Or, you know, when will Jesus come again? and so on, that have nothing to do with the doctrine of salvation, and therefore we should table them until the end and say, that's a great question, let me answer that after I finish. And usually they forget the question anyway. Well, let me conclude by saying how we conclude preaching the gospel. And this is something that uh, Jesse and I have developed, where when we uh, finish preaching the gospel, the, what we like to do is to describe three differences between the them of now and the them of before.
First of all, a difference of beliefs. Second, a difference of destiny. And third, a difference of religious affiliation. First, the difference of beliefs. Do you see, I'll say, the difference between what I've showed you here from the Bible and what you believed before? Or can you see a difference between what I just explained to you or what the Bible says and what you now believe and what you used to believe an hour ago or yesterday? Yes. Because it means that before you were not believing in Christ, so you were not saved. Second, the difference of destiny. Therefore, because you were not believing the gospel of Christ before, because you didn't trust that salvation's free, it's a gift, if you would have died an hour ago or yesterday or so on, would you have gone to heaven or to hell? To hell, of course. Of course, in a loving way, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, and being someone who is with all gentleness and meekness of Christ, showing people how to go to heaven. And then, finally, the difference of religious affiliation. If they are members of a false church, like the Pentecostal church, the Catholic church, the Anglican church, the three biggest false religions in Uganda, what we'll always do is say, now, the Bible teaches something different from what your church teaches. And we'll turn to verses, like Matthew chapter 7, beware of false prophets. Like 1 John chapter 4, try the spirits. Like Galatians chapter 1, another gospel that we've received. Uh, like, for example, Romans chapter 16, verse 17, mark them and avoid them. For they that are such serve not their, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Because they teach a doctrine other than what you've learned. And it's a great verse because it says, a doctrine other than what you've learned, in Romans chapter 16, verse 17. And so therefore, what we often like to do then is explain to them what their church teaches in contrast to what the Bible teaches, especially if it's a very uh, clearly a false church. If the church is questionable whether it's believing the gospel or not, at any rate, what we like to do is explain to them, now listen, how many years have been, you been going to this church for? And they've never showed you the truth. So at, at least this church does not care about your eternal soul to save you from hell. And so if it's a good church, of course, and they've only been there for a short time, we don't want to pull them away from it. But what we like to do then is make sure that this person understands that in order for them to be saved, they have to stop trusting in a false religion and to put their faith in Christ, change their beliefs, change their understanding of where they were going and where they can go now, and then also change their trust to a false religion to Christ. Not their church to our church, but their church versus the Bible. The Bible is everything. So... Uh, this is what Pastor Fenix described as what he calls burning down the house, where you're, you're removing the opportunity of them to go back into that. And as long as we're pulling them out of the fire that we're burning on the house, that's great. So we're <laughs> going to burn down the house and show them that you need to come to the house of God uh, after they understand the gospel. So uh, we conclude by leading them in a prayer. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, of course, the sinner's prayer when someone uh, verbally repeats something, is not something that can save them if it's not prayed in faith. What saves the person is the faith they put in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they have to believe in order to be saved. But the sinner's prayer is something that will oftentimes be, allow them to put their faith in Christ or cause them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Having recognition, they have to make a decision to trust in Christ in order to be saved. And therefore, Jesus says in John chapter 4, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Soul winning is the one thing. It is the one thing that a Christian needs to make sure that they learn how to do, know how to do, and are good at doing. It is actually the one thing that I am so surprised at how easy it is to preach the gospel, how simple it is to preach the gospel, and how greatly you're rewarded in heaven for so doing. And therefore, Paul the Apostle describes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they might be saved, because we save many by saving some. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the great privilege of being able to be workers together with you. Lord, I ask that people here today, uh, hearing me, would recognize the important need that they have of redeeming the time because the days are evil, and of going out preaching Christ. And dear God, that every single person here would be a winner of souls, and to be someone who is indeed exceedingly...